Good evening, everybody. This is John Lennon from Doris here. And thank you all for joining us for our second webinar in our series. We're live on Facebook now, as well as here on Zoom. So we'll get started. Um, our first webinar was two weeks ago, and that was on citizenship. And the material for that is now available on our website, www.doris.org in four languages. It's in English, it's in French, it's in Pashto, and it's in Arabic. So tonight's session is on family reunification. And my colleagues, Fiona McCall and Rachel Birmingham, will give a presentation on that. And then we'll take questions. So please put your questions in the Q&A as we go along, and we'll try to get to all of them before the end, if we can. So this webinar will be in English, but as I said, with the other webinar, we'll also have information available for this one in Pashto and Arabic and French on our website. And we'll put a link to that in our chat facility as we go along. We'll also make a recording of the presentation and that'll be available for anyone who isn't able to attend this evening or wants to listen to it again. And that will be on our website in the next day or two. So as I mentioned at our last webinar, Doris has been in existence for 21 years. And that's as long as we've had the direct provision system for where many of you may have had to live in for several years. Um, now we produced a timeline charting some of the significant changes and some of the campaigns since the year 2000 when direct provision started. And, and we charted from one of the first reports, which was in January 2001. It documented the experiences of child poverty, social exclusion among asylum seekers. And we went through the history over the 21 years, all the way up to the white paper that was produced by government in February of this year that promises to end direct provision. So that commitment is, is quite welcome but we now need to see actions and we now need to see that being put into effect and so that we don't have direct provision anymore so that people who arrive in Ireland seeking international protection can live in the community like everybody else. Now it's worth noting of course that over the years direct provision has been criticized quite a lot. It's been criticized by the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission it's been criticised by the Ombudsman for Children, by the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, by the UN Committee on Racial Discrimination, by lots of different bodies. Now, at Doris, we've supported quite a lot of people who have come through the system, um, many of whom eventually got the refugee status or subsidiary protection or leave to remain. And we've supported quite a few people through the family reunification process. And we continue to do this now, even through COVID-19. And quite understandably, we get a lot of questions, not least because of the delays and how slow the process is, and some of the difficulties in the process. So we're going to try to answer some of those questions tonight. Yeah. We're also, involved in Doris in a lot of campaigns to bring about changes in policy and the way people are treated. One of our recent pieces of work that is worth mentioning is on access to work for people who have come through the international protection system and direct provision. There are lots of barriers to work, but we're continuing to work with organizations like Recruit Refugees Ireland, with the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission to try to address those. Okay, so um, I'll, I'm going to hand over now to my colleague Fiona, but before I hand over to her, I just want to note that these sessions and the translations have been made possible by the Community Foundation for Ireland and for RTE Does Comic Relief and the Government of Ireland funding. So we're grateful to them for um, the support that has been given to make these possible. So as I said, use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask questions as we go through the presentation or use the chat. We'll try to get as many to as many of those as we can after the presentations when Fiona 
and Rachel are, are finished. So with that, I'll um, hand over to Fiona and we'll, um, as I said, be, be back to, to help with the Q&A after the presentation. Great stuff. Thank you, John. And um, good evening to everyone joining us tonight um, for this webinar on applying for family reunification. Um, and as John was explaining there, um, Doris was first established in the year 2000 to provide support to asylum seekers living in direct provision in our area. And um, just a bit of background information, our office is in, in Limerick City. So the vision really of Doris is to see a society where equality and respect for the human rights of all people are realized. And it's our mission to achieve this through personal and collaborative advocacy, through the law, through intercultural dialogue, support, inclusion, and empowerment. And we want to be able to do this working at local, national, and international levels. So we're gonna be focusing on around about six or seven main areas this evening, um, main areas of importance really when applying for, to bear in mind when applying for family reunification. So firstly, we're gonna be looking at who is eligible to apply for the application and who isn't. Um, we'll then take a brief look at another potential pathway for family reunification for those that aren't actually eligible under this particular scheme, uh, under the sections 56 and 57 of the 2015 International Protection Act. We'll then look at the application process itself and how you actually go about making the application. Um, we're gonna spend also spend some time focusing on the relevant supporting documentation that's required to allow your, your application to be processed fully. Um, we'll also cover possible reasons for refusal of your application. And then we'll also look at what steps need to be taken if your application is approved. We'll also look at the impact restrictions due to the COVID pandemic have had regarding the application process as a whole. And then as John mentioned, we'll finish up at the end, uh, giving you a little opportunity to ask um, any questions that you might have. Okay, so who can apply? So eligible sponsors are those people who have been granted either refugee status or subsidiary protection. And you must apply within 12 months of having received your grant letter for this protection status. So for example, if you're granted on say the 31st of May, uh, 2021, you must apply by the 31st of May 2022. You have 12 months in which to make the application. It's important to note, I'd say, that if you've been granted permission to remain or have any other kind of stamp for permission, you're not eligible to apply for family reunification under this Act, under the 2015 Act. However, you may be eligible to apply for a long stay visa for some of your family members. So if you are eligible to apply, who can you apply for? As the sponsor, you can apply for your spouse or civil partner, but only if your marriage or partnership was in existence at the time you made your application for international protection. You can also apply for your children as long as they are under the age of 18 years and they're not married. It's important to note here that your child must be either a biological child or a child that has been legally adopted. 
If the sponsor is under 18 years of age, he or she can apply for his or her parents. And if under 18 and not married, the sponsor can also apply for his or her siblings, as long as they are also under 18 and not married. Any other family members, unfortunately, are not eligible. So, another pathway, as I mentioned, for family reunification, if you're not eligible under the 2015 Act, is to apply for a long stay visa. Now, eligible sponsors here for this application are either Irish citizens who have earned 40,000 euros over the last three years prior to the application, or you can be a non-EEA sponsor who has a stamp for visa and you're earning 30,000 per year for two years prior to the date of application. But it's important to note here that the Minister for Justice does have and can show some discretion on this application on the el eligibility criteria for those that have been granted a protection status. So if you've been given refugee status or subsidiary protection, you can go ahead and apply for this if you don't have eligible family members under the 2015 Act and discretion may be shown for this application. Also, there, um, those on a disability allowance may be exempt from income requirements as well for this application. Um, unfortunately, students, international protection applicants, i.e. those still in the IP system, um, those with stamp three visa holders and those on visitor visas can't apply for this particular application. And in terms of eligible family members, the sponsor may apply for. It's important to note that any family member can be applied for here. However, it is also really important to note that the more distant or the more tenuous the relationship is between you and the family member that you're applying for, the more supporting documentation will be required for this. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you're applying for a child over the age of 18, uh, you have to be able to provide sufficient level of um, dependency, proof of dependency for that family member. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how to actually apply for a long stay visa? Firstly, um, an online application, and you can find this on the INIS website, needs to be completed online and submitted online. Once you submit that application online, you must print out the visa summary sheet, which has to be then signed by the applicant. Then the visa summary sheet, the visa fee, and all the supporting documentation must be sent to the relevant embassy and the address of that relevant embassy can be found at the bottom of the summary sheet. And it is strongly advised that you do not start the online application until you have collected pretty much all of the required supporting documentation. So now back to how to apply for family reunification under the 2015 Act. The eligible sponsor, i.e. someone who has been granted either refugee status or subsidiary protection, must apply in writing to the family reunification section. They have to include a letter, they have to write, and in the initial letter, they should include the following. They need to have a copy of the ministerial decision unit letter that grants the status, refugee status or subsidiary protection status. You have to include a copy of your Irish residence permit 
And then you have to include the information of all the people, all your family members that you are applying for. So you will need to include their full name, their dates of birth, and um, also what relationship they are to you. So once you've submitted this information to the Family Reunification Unit, you'll need to, you will receive the relevant or appropriate questionnaire, uh, which you must complete within a time frame, complete and return within a time frame of 28 days. So supporting documentation. What supporting documentation do you need for this application? So you need to submit a birth certificate and you need to submit um, a national identity card and passport. And you also re uh, need to submit two recent color photograph sized uh, photo, um, passport photos for each of the applicants that you are applying for. So for each of your family members. It's important to note here that originals must be submitted. So we do strongly advise that you use registered post when sending on all of these very important documents. So now I will hand over to you, Rachel, and uh, for you to take us through the other slides on supporting documentation, as well as reasons for refusal, what you do when you're granted, and also impacts of COVID on making an application. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Yeah, um, I'll echo what Fiona said there again, because it is very important registered post <laughs> if you're sending any original documents always always registered post and um, and make sure you keep copies as well and just because it's always important to, to have copies of those documents um so following on there's quite a long list of supporting documentation um that could be required based on your situation and who you're applying for so if you're applying for a spouse or a civil partner it's really important that you have your marriage certificate. Um, and I know that this can be a difficulty for some people, depending on where um, your marriage took place, if it was a traditional or a religious marriage. Um, so it's if you can, make sure that the marriage is a registered marriage um, and that you have that documentation. Some people might have what's called a marriage book. Um, from, again, particular countries, this is um, a, a piece of information that they would have. You might have a receipt for any registration fees paid for your marriage. Again, if applicable, um, you might not have paid anything. Um, you will need to show documentary evidence of shared resources. Um, so if you were married, they might want to see bank accounts. Um, if you owned a house together, they might want to see that documentation. Um, if you have been sending money to your spouse, and I know a lot of people do, um, you know, send money throughout the entire asylum process, make sure you keep receipts of this um, and they will ask to see that. Um, and just a few other things there, just evidence again around your marriage, when it took place, where it took place, etc. cetera. So um, all of this will be asked for when you uh, are filling in your questionnaire and as many of those documents as you can provide, um, you, you should, if you can. Again, if you're applying for a spouse or civil partner, this might be relevant to you, it might not. Um, a final degree of divorce, if you have had a previous spouse. Um, if unfortunately, you know, you had a previous spouse who has died, they will ask for the death certificate. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, you might have legal documentation for adoption if you have adopted um, you know, a second spouse's child. So keep that in mind as well. Um, and they'll want, you know, again, addresses and any other original documentation that um, might be relevant to your spouse or civil partner. And um, it's kind of hard to have an exhaustive list of what they might ask um, just based on your situation. So with that in mind, um, they might ask for further documentation down the line. Um, again, I want to say this a few times because it is really important. If you have a child who is not your biological child, um, 
you have to have proof of legal adoption. So if you are a ward of the court um, or you've just been looking after them, um, I know that does happen often, that won't count. They won't be eligible. There has to be an actual legal proof of adoption. Um, you may also be asked for a letter from another parent or guardian, um, just allowing your child to travel. Um, and also copies of money transfers. Again, if you're sending money to your child, they will want to see proof of that. Um, it's important to note as well that they do quite often ask for DNA tests if they're unsure of the status of a biological child. So if a DNA test is required, the department uses a company called Cellmark in Dublin, um, and they won't charge you a fee unless that test comes back negative. So it, just to keep that in mind, we have seen that several times that someone thinks the test will come back positive, it comes back negative, and they now have to pay for this quite expensive fee. So moving on to uh, reasons for refusal. Um, if you are missing any of that required or requested documentation without explanation, um, that could be a reason for refusal. And I say without explanation, because I know that, again, documents are lost, things aren't always able to be, you know, sent from overseas. So if you do have a legitimate explanation as to why you're missing something, it's important to make sure that you tell that to the department. Um, if your family member is, unfortunately, you know, one of the family members that's not eligible, it will be refused. So. Um, as I was saying before, if they're not a legally adopted child, if they're just a ward, it will be refused. Um, siblings, parents, unless you are under 18, will be refused. If you're past the time limit to apply, uh, they're very strict on this as well. If you're past the 12 months, it's going to be refused, unfortunately. Um, and there's not a lot of wiggle room with that. Um, if your marriage occurred after you received your refugee or subsidiary status, excuse me, and um, it again will be refused. Um, they have no leniency on this one at all either. Um, as I stated before, negative DNA test, unfortunately, that would be grounds for your application to be refused as well. Um, as well as inconsistent documentation or false or misleading information. Um, we've seen this a few times where I know that documentation isn't always consistent when you have translations and you have dates that come from different calendar systems. So make sure when you are making your documents that everything matches. It's all you know consistent as it goes along. And if there is any piece of information that doesn't quite match up with the rest of them, again, an explanation to the department. And unfortunately, this is kind of the the bad news slide. Um, if it is refused, there is no appeal process. So you won't be able to come back and ask them to look at it again. We'll move on to a, a bit of a happier topic if you are granted. Uh, once you're granted, your family members will have 12 months to enter the state. So we can use that example from earlier. If, say, your application was granted 31st of May 2021, then all of your family members have to enter the state by 31st of May, 2022. Um, you must apply for visas for each family member. And unfortunately, there is a fee for each application of 60 euros. So if you had you know, several family members, it can be quite expensive. So just keep that in mind. Uh, then once you have your visa applications and uh, their passports, they must be sent to Dublin. And I have that in all caps because we've seen some people um, just a little bit confused after doing the online visas for them. All applications for visas for family reunification in, from this act go to Dublin. Um, and when you get your grant letter, it will give you that address on there. So there's no need to stress about it. They'll tell you exactly where it needs to go. Um, and once they're in the state, they then need to register their permission at either Berg Key if they're in Dublin or at uh, their local GNIB office. Um, if you are having problems, as I said, it can be quite expensive um, to bring your family members over. If you're having issues raising those funds, 
the Irish Red Cross and IOM do operate a travel assistance fund. So um, they can help you to pay for your flights. If you want to avail of this fund, um, you have to make that application before your visas. So keep that in mind as well um, to contact the Red Cross before you go online and you submit those visa applications. Um, and this is just their information here. So they're based in Dublin um, and you can see that number and the email there. And again, I don't, I don't want to say it's a negative, but it, it, it is really, if you have any missing family members, um, the Irish Red Cross do have what they call restoring family links service. Um, and they can assist to help search for family members who may be missing abroad. Um, and I might just show you that website if I go out of here. So this is the uh, Red Cross webpage for missing relatives. Um, and they have a service, they have several different ways that you could um, look for your family members. They have an online service, a tracing service. Um, and in Endorus, we have actually used this a few times um, through Jennifer. Um, and they have a messaging service and they also can help if you are having problems getting travel documents. So. If anybody wants to make contact with them, they're lovely and they're extremely helpful. Um, and we've, like I said, we work with them quite closely on, um, in particular, their, their travel assistance. I'll just go back into here now. Oh. The joys of technology now trying to get back in here. <laughs> we'll just zoom through. Ah, everyone's favorite topic, COVID-19. So unfortunately, there are significant delays with family reunification at the moment because of COVID-19 um, and um, kind of legacy cases that were in the department before the pandemic started. They are still working though. Um, so your correspondence might be a bit delayed, but rest assured that they're, they're still working on them. Applicants can email the department and I've put the, the email address there and that will be up on our website as well. So if you are wondering, you haven't heard from them in a few months, just pop them an email, make sure you put in your application number and your person ID number, and that makes it easier for them to, to look up your application. Um, and visas for family reunification, um, again, if there's an issue of travel because of COVID, those visas can be deferred, um, you know, in, to a time that they can actually physically make that travel. Um, and I, we do have to note, again, it's an ever-changing topic, but they may be asked to mandatory hotel quarantine once they arrive. So do keep that in mind. We are working to kind of see if there's any way to get if, again, financial assistance or um, how that is going to work for family reunification um, applicants and their family. We haven't received much back from the department, but again, it's changing day by day. So do just keep in mind, they might have to quarantine. And I think that is pretty much it now. We're available on info at doris.org or the other best number to get us on is the second one there, 83 zero eight zero two three seven eight so do get in contact with us or go to our website if you have any questions in relating to your specific circumstances or if you have any general questions or want any advice or, or support as i said we'll have the material for this um, webinar up online the translations of the slides um, are already there and we have the links in the chat for you the recording, the presentations will be up tomorrow as well. Um, before I wrap up, Fiona or Rachel, do you have any additional comments or? Yeah, just to reiterate to what you've said, really, John, you know, if anyone has any questions that they need answering, would like assistance with, whether it's, it's uh, support filling out um, the application forms, 
doing the initial uh, application letter uh, or any queries that we can help with, uh, answer over the phone or via email Zoom, just please do not hesitate to get in contact with us on those uh, contact details. Thank you. Yeah, I'll echo um, the same that Fiona said, get in touch if you have any questions. Um, and we didn't go into it too much here because it could be a whole probably webinar on its own. But um, if you have family that are recently arrived as well, um, and you kind of have some difficulties in getting assimilated, um, yeah, just get in touch. We can help once they've arrived as well. We can help with that. We're always glad to get suggestions of other webinars or things that we can do that would be of assistance to people. So to wrap up, thanks again to Fiona and to Rachel. I also want to say thanks to Brian, who's behind the scenes, making sure that all this runs and, and runs smoothly. Um, thanks to all of you as well for attending tonight. And we look forward to being in touch with you all in some capacity or other again in the future. So thanks to everybody and good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, John. Good night, everyone.